Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for coming along to this policy exchange event to talk about um, small business lending. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm Becky Barrow. I'm the business correspondent at the Daily Mail, which means that I write news stories about everything from pensions to mortgages, working women, um, to other financial issues, but I have written a lot about small business lending. Um, this was because about three years ago, um, Mervyn King, when he was then um, obviously Governor of the Bank of England, spoke to um, MPs and Treasury Select Committee and talked at length about the experiences that he had had travelling around the country and meeting small business owners who had had, um, in his words, heartbreaking experiences with their banks, being unable to get the money that they needed to grow, um, to expand their business. And since then, I have written um, a lot about small business lending. And the government has launched um, various schemes, um, Project Merlin, um, funding for lending. Um, but so far, um, certainly the net lending figures are still negative. Um, and hopefully new banks such as Shawbrook, which is kindly sponsoring this event, um, will come along to challenge the big five banks. Um, but there are lots of other ways to borrow money and these are important to highlight. Sure, Anthony's keen on me mentioning the fact that there are other ways for small businesses to grow other than um, the big five banks. You've got peer-to-peer -peer lending, crowdfunding being two of the most mm. obvious examples. So without further ado, I will introduce our excellent panel. Um, starting from the left, we have Nora Senior, who is a president of the British Chambers for Commerce and a former Scottish Businesswoman of the Year. Um, we now have Ian Henderson, who is chief executive of Shawbrook Bank. After um, a long time working in RBS, mm -hmm. Ian is now taking on RBS um, and building it up. It's a valued PBA member. And is a very valued <laughs> member of the BBA. Uh, Marco James is the Tory MP of Stourbridge and has now joined um, the number 10 policy unit. Congratulations. Anthony Brown, a former journalist of many years standing, just told me he's not interested in going back to his former job, which is the Stephanie Flanders, economics correspondent at the BBC, and now chief executive of the BBA. And right at the end, James Barty from Policy Exchange, a former banker himself for many years. I think it was 20 in the biography I read. Um, and now um, the financial expert, small business lending expert at Policy Exchange. So we're going to start with Margot, and then we're going to go along the panel. Everybody's going to speak for um, no more than five minutes. And then the most important bit, we're going to open up to the floor and hope you've all got lots of questions to ask. So Margot, far away. Well, <coughs> thank you very much indeed, Becky. Um, I thought I would just spend my five minutes trying to encapsulate some of my experience of bank lending when I was in business myself. Um, my constituency experience, because obviously Stourbridge, um, part of the back country, has a lot of SMEs um, uh, within and around. Uh, a lot of my constituents work for SMEs. And also, um, I spent two years when I was first elected on the Business Innovation and Skills Select Committee, and we did an inquiry into bank lending while I was on that committee, um, which was about 18 months ago, I think. And um, finally, um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about export finance, because in addition to being on the number 10 policy unit, I'm also PPS to the Trade and Investment Minister, um, Lord Stephen Green himself ex-chairman and chief executive of, of HSBC. Um, to start with, I think uh, since I've been elected, this has been a big issue and it's been a conundrum between when we were on the select committee, um, we heard a lot of evidence from representatives of small businesses particularly, and indeed big businesses, um, that talked about the difficulty of getting different types of business finance. Um, but Likewise, we also saw, saw heard very heartfelt uh, experience from the banks, um, the British Banking Association, for example, um, who talked to us about the extent of lending that they were undertaking 
and the proportion of SMEs who were successful in their loan applications. And I don't think we ever really did get to the bottom of where this divide ended up between people telling us on the one hand they couldn't get loans, people telling us on the other hand that the loans are plenty. So that, that was uh, quite a conundrum um, back a sort of 18 months ago. And I was going to also say that I don't think this problem is that new because certainly when I was in business I ran a service company and of course we were light on assets and when we got into trouble, we, were, we had a 15 year career before we sold, and when we got into trouble, uh, there was no way we could get any extension of our overdraft facility without my, part, my business partner and I putting our houses up as security. <coughs> and that day I signed my house over to guarantee my co company's overdraft. It was not the best day of my life, as you can imagine. And that was, I would say, probably in 97, when the economy was buoyant. Uh, so I don't think this is an, a, new, a new problem. But anyway, um, I mean, the business department statistics, um, the current statistics, most recent ones, um, show some light, shed some light on the matter. 37% of SMEs have no need of external finance or don't have any external finance. Two things not necessarily the same. Um, there's about half a million loans and roughly half a million loans and overdraft applications per annum. And according to the banks, uh, depending on the size of business you're talking about, between 75 and 90 percent of those are approved. So I think there's been issues in the last few years. As, as we're coming out of recession, I think things are definitely improving. But the issues have been um, business paying down debt. You know, there's an awful lot of SMEs that um, have been preferring to pay down debt rather than take on new debt. Cons businesses in my constituency have told me that they're frightened to go to the banks. Um, to raise the, their profile because they're worried that the terms, and I have got examples where this has happened, where terms of, uh, have worsened um, simply on account of the SME putting its head above the parapet. Um, the banks I've met have been weighed down by the very, very stringent regulatory regime that they now have to comply with. Uh, and I think, uh, and I'm interested in another panel member's view of this, I think that to a certain extent over the last few years we have, we have gone um, to the other extreme in regulating the bank's capital uh, requirements and liquidity requirements um, such that banks that are very, very keen to do business are very, feel themselves very, very constrained um, by these new requirements and of course our banks have had to be compliant with Basel III before uh, the rest of Europe <coughs> has stated that that should be the case. And you do have to wonder how we can, on the one hand, be demanding banks lend more and more, but on the other hand, um, tighten the screws um, on their compliance regime. I, f I find myself that that has been um, a contradiction that banks have found it very difficult to live with. Um, I've had very few cases really brought to my attention by businesses um, in my constituency. To be honest, I've had more companies um, when I visited them say that during the difficult years, you know, during uh, up to about a year ago, um, some quite a few uh, businesses have told me that it's actually been the banks that have kept them going, um, predominantly with invoice financing. Um, so, you know, that I know is not, uh, I can remember from my days, but it's not the most attractive way. Um, I'll, I'll just, can I just conclude by just saying a couple of words about export finance? I used to get a lot of com complaints about the UK Export Credit Guarantee Department, um, which was just associated really with the defence business. Um, and I'm very proud that this government has reorientated that organisation, now called UK Export Finance. There are products and services available for SMEs now. No longer do companies have to think, well, it is attractive, the idea of going into export markets, especially beyond the European Union, but, you know, we can't finance it. Uh, there's no way, if you're manufacturing like most of my businesses are, you know, you might be taking a year to fulfill an order. How are you going to finance the, the capital other than getting um, a, a guarantee? And that's what they can now get from, from the government, essentially. Uh, so that, and that, that business is now booming, um, and it's got some way to go. But if companies are wanting to export, the support is there, and companies need to know about it, as well as the banks. 
um, because that is a way of growing business um, without taking on a lot of debt, but just by having that security behind you when you start exporting. All for now, happy to do the Q&A later. Thank you, Margot. Ian? Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I represent Shawbrook Bank. Uh, we're quite unusual. Uh, we're a British bank that is lending to businesses uh, across the UK. We've only been in existence for two and a half years, but in that time we've lent £1.3 billion uh, to in excess of 20,000 businesses. The thing that's been common across most of the business that we have done is it's been rejected by the bigger banks. So they've said there's no proposition there to back, but Shawbrook, through the Shawbrook methodology, which as it says here, no fuss, no frills, what we do is old-fashioned banking. We bring in customer deposits from businesses and consumers, and we lend it primarily to businesses, but to some consumers as well. But what makes us different is that we don't apply the big bank cookie cutter approach, where you pull it, pop it into a hopper, shake it out. If it pops out the bottom, it's a yes. If it doesn't, if it touches the sides, it's an automatic no. And that means a lot of fantastic propositions don't get backed. And that's why I think the Challenger Bank fraternity, of which Shawbrook is a part, have actually got a genuine role to play. The reason I was keen to support this event though was that the majority of businesses across the UK don't realise there's a choice beyond the big five. And it's difficult for little banks like Shawbrook and other challengers like Aldermore and Metro Bank in, in London, etc., with their modest marketing budgets to have that share of voice against the Nat Wests, the Lloyds, the Barclays, etc. So the way we compete is by providing a fantastic service. And I'd like to think that the 20,000 plus businesses that either deposit with us or have taken money from us been very happy with the service that they've received. So the challenge for me uh, and the challenger group is to, is to let the, the great British small business public know that there are alternatives to the big five on the high street. So what we do that make, makes us different is that every single loan that we look at is actually looked at by a human being. So we, we assess the proposition, we assess the business and we assess the individual. And guess what, you know, on the back of that assessment, when we do say yes, typically that's a good business proposition. And while we're only two and a half years old, you know, the, the arrears and bad debt experiences that we have had is negligible. I've got a £400 million commercial real estate business that are only two loans in arrears. Now, while it's not yet fully seasoned, that tells me that I'm doing some of the underwriting right. In some respects, I might be a little bit too conservative, present company, uh, excused. Uh, and, so, and we're looking to see what can we do to open this up. So our challenge within Shawbrook Bank, having in two and a half years built a business from nothing that didn't exist to one that's now lent you know, 1.3 billion pounds and plans to grow a lot more, how can we start to broaden our proposition and go into new lines of business? And that's what we're doing. A big business for us, as it is with Aldermore and other challenger banks, is asset finance. Most of our business historically has been wheeled assets. Where else can we take it? So now we're doing things like marine, we're doing light aircraft, we're doing the servicing of, of wind farms, we're looking at pockets of opportunity, which are probably too small for the big banks to worry about. And we are finding you know, huge you know, potential opportunities where by offering a tailored service in a niche area that's probably too small for the big banks to worry about, there's an underserved market that we are there to serve. And you know, I would just welcome through the Q&A your thoughts on what we can do to, to let the British small business public know that there's a choice beyond the big five. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, over to you, um, thank you. Uh, I just want to say uh, two things, basically. One, that there is um, that bank loans aren't the only form of finance for SMEs, uh, and two, uh, that there are backing up uh, Ian's point that there are a lot of different banks out there. So I, I'm constantly struck by the debate on uh, on SME lending. It's about the only thing that uh, politicians seem to want to speak to me about. Uh, if, uh, this is my second fringe remote today. Uh, the um, uh, is an assumption that basically the only form of finance that SMEs can get is, is bank loans. And, it, and actually, uh, the, the French I did earlier actually was the whole of the French capital people, and they were, they were completely sort of outraged by this, but, uh, uh, this suggestion. But it's, politicians seem to if you're a startup and you haven't got any assets, you haven't got a track record, you haven't got uh, anything at all except a bright idea, that you should be able to go and somebody demand £100,000 or something from someone. The, the, in most other countries, in America, in Germany, in France, and so on, there are far more diversified forms of financing for SMEs, and that is healthy. That's healthy for the economy. It's healthy for uh, the SMEs. And in the uh, as any any uh, 
uh, business economic will tell you or any expert that the, there's, a, there's a pathway for business finance. When you start up, normally people, most startups get money from friends and family who just want to help someone out or somebody's got a redundancy payment or something. And then you, you start getting your, that's your seed capital. You, you, you then get uh, money from uh, and maybe an angel investor, which isn't very developed in, uh, uh, in the UK, but it's uh, more, it is more developed elsewhere. People, people have made money from earlier businesses who want to support other businesses, and they get a bit of equity for it. They then go to a venture capital, and then it helps build up the whole sector. So we do need, what I think is important for the UK is to actually explore ways to develop, uh, to diversify the funding sources for SMEs, to, build, to help build up uh, those SMEs. It, and the, the only, there are many other forms of finance, and Ian uh, mentioned some of them, the, the, the bank loans, and there's asset finance, uh, which is very important. And uh, there's also uh, supply chain finance, trade finance, invoice finance, business angels, there's community development financial institutions, the, uh, there's the European Investment Bank, well, I'll list them here, the uh, Enterprise Finance Guarantee, which the government does, the Export Enterprise Finance Guarantee, uh, and so on. There are many different forms of finance other than straight bank loans that SMEs can get. So the whole the whole debate just being about bank loans is is not a, a sort of fully representative debate on the uh, what the situation is on the uh, actually on the ground or indeed what it should be. Um, the other uh, point is that there are uh, there are more than uh, five banks out there, as Ian said. There are, there are. One thing that struck me in this job, and I've been doing it a year, is actually that the banking industry in the UK is far more diversified than most people realise. There are, I've got 170 different members, about half of them are foreign banks, uh, which used to be, before the crisis, very heavily involved in SME finance in the UK, but they've uh, exited. Uh, but uh, there are uh, you know, a lot of different uh, British banks that are involved with it. It is, the market is quite concentrated. But the, when, people, when, when businesses come to us and say they're turned down for a loan, uh, we, you know, that our advice is, well, go to another bank. There is a presumption in the UK that uh, amongst their SMEs, uh, amongst a lot of them, that actually they should only go to a loan for, to the bank where they have their business account. And we, they, they're sort of modern bank, as it were. They only have one relationship with one bank. It's like, well, actually, you can have your business account at one bank and then go and get a loan at another bank. If one bank says no, go to another bank that might say yes. And they do have different lending policies. And, you know, Shawbrooks is, uh, is, is, Ian's been pointing out how theirs is, is different. And you should shop around. Like, people shop around for mortgages and they're very happy. I mean, they, they, they get the concept of shopping around for mortgages, but they don't really get the concept of shopping around for uh, loans. So don't take no as a no. Uh, we, at the BBA, we do we do run uh, uh, well, a little side business, uh, running uh, asset uh, access to finance programs for um, the banks. And one part of it is an appeal service, uh, which is uh, which the big banks are part of, uh, where if you are turned down for a loan, you have a right to an, uh, appeal that uh, uh, rejection, uh, and forty percent of the appeals are uh, upheld, or so where the lending decision is overturned once the. Uh, uh, the application for a loan is looked at um, uh, more closely, and it, but that rejection rate is clearly far too high because a bank should be getting the decisions right first time. Uh, the, uh, um, but having said that, at least it shows that appeals process is working, and we certainly want to get the awareness of the appeals process to be a lot higher to give uh, SMEs confidence to uh, come forward to their to their banks. Thank you very much, Anthony. Perfectly timed. You can see you getting nervous there. <laughs> 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 Over to you, Nora. Thank you. Um, I thought I would just uh, start off by quoting some statistics from um, uh, our most recent uh, British Chamber survey on access to finance, um, which really concurs with what most of the panel members have said already. Um, almost half of firms use banks or building societies, and why is that? Because that's usually where their mortgage is, where they've held their savings accounts since they've been children. Um, and because that's where most of um, the information and advertising com comes from, only 10% use equity and only 8% use um, grants or venture capital, private equity, peer-to-peer -peer funding or any other form. And part of that is just because there is not enough information around of uh, what the sources of funding are. So it's fine to say shop around, but actually SMEs don't know where to go to shop around and that's something that, that Chambers have been working on. And it's also more difficult for small businesses to access external finance now than it was even before the financial crisis, partly because 
um, banks are requiring more information before they approve credit facilities and they're also likely to use um, imperfect information as a justification for rejection rather than in cutting the cost of assessing risk more fully. So it was very refreshing to uh, hear from Shawbrook that you know they, they approach it from the old-fashioned sense of um, assessment rather than rejection. And those that's particularly true in construction and hospitality sectors. And there's also the phenomenon of um, discouraged demand, which translates that businesses that want, fi want finance but they don't want to um, a, a approach banks because of the assumption that they will, they will either be rejected or they will have their other credit facilities re-evaluated, none of which they want. And smaller businesses particularly find it hardest of all to access finance. Um, and the funding for lending scheme seems only to be um, available to safe bets rather than those that are perhaps more um, higher risk. And unfortunately, some of those growth firms are still being left out in the cold, and that's um, a hindrance to um, economic growth and economic recovery. Um, the business bank, um, it's, that's essential, we think, to, um, to plug the gap in, um, in, in business provision. Um, but it has to have the ability to work with bank with businesses directly on the ground, not just through the same old high street institutions. So what do we want? I suppose four things. Address the current gap in relationships, transparency and trust between banks and businesses. And if businesses are rejected, then it's helpful if they can understand on which grounds um, they have been uh, rejected. Uh, what, what is the transparency around lending decision and widen the access to information? Also increase uh, competition to the banking system so that there is real choice out there. Widen access to, com to commercial lending such as you know, the funding circles, the, 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 the market, in, um, the market uh, invoice, the platform blacks, etc. Et there are a whole load of platforms out there for funding. But many are niche players, and um, we think that regulators, um, including the successor to the Financial Services Authority and uh, the, the Bank of England, have to ensure um, that, there is st that there is an environment where mainstream competition can still expand. The new business bank needs to be better capitalised. We welcome the £1 billion uh, uh, that's been committed to the new business bank. That's an important first step. Um, but if it's to be successful, it needs funding on a greater scale. And what we're calling for is um, nine million pounds, three billion, sorry, three, three billion pounds per annum over three years, nine billion pounds. So a stronger capital base, which will help raise funding from money markets. Um, and also, uh, the last one, Bank of England and the, uh, the Financial Conduct Authority could do more to uh, improve access to finance. For example, the existing quantitative easing programme could be used to purchase private sector assets other than gilts, including securitised SME loans, as we think that would reduce the risk when banks are looking to lend to businesses. So just some suggestions out there as to things that might be considered in terms of lending. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, we have James from Bonus Exchange. Uh, no, thank you. Um, well, we've been doing um, quite a lot of work on, on the whole issue of SME finance this year, and um, I find it was kind of ironic in a way that it was Mervyn King that kicked off your interest in SME finance because if there's one person that's done the most damage to SME finance uh, in, in the UK, I think Mervyn should put his hand up for it because this drive to, to higher capital ratios which the Bank of England is very much led, is, is one of the main reasons why SME lending has basically dried up in this economy. Um, you know, for the banks, they're encouraged to shrink their balance sheet. When you have to shrink your balance sheet and you're capital weighted, uh, the bit that you end up shrinking most is the bit which demands most capital. And SME loans are the most capital hungry uh, part of your balance sheet. Yeah, it's just very, very simple mathematics once you look at bar three. Um, and it's very interesting, because you know, one of the events um, that we did earlier this year uh, with, with another person that's trying to grow their, their loan book, which is Santander, and, and they said to us, look, we're trying to grow our, our corporate loan book, um, but in order to add 500 million to our corporate loan book, we have to reduce our mortgage book by 2.8 billion. Um, yeah. Therein lies the problem, and that's why funding for lending has actually been very successful at boosting mortgage lending and not very successful at boosting SME lending. So one of the things that we've campaigned really hard on at Policy Exchange is to get the Bank of England 
um, to stop trying to raise capital requirements for the banks. Um, and very distressingly today, they actually put out a notice to say they're going to run even more stress tests next year. Um, and in today's notice, they said, not only are we going to run a stress test and, and post the stress test, you still have to be above our regulatory minimum, uh, we might actually even add to that to take us above international standards. Uh, it's very unhelpful. And the Bank of England cannot go around on the one hand saying we want more SME lending and then on the other hand say we want more capital for the banks. The two are just, you know, they're not consistent. And it's all very well for the bank, and I've had this argument with Andy Haldane at the bank, to say, ah, oh, but the banks can go and raise more capital. It's not that easy, um, as some of the banks are finding at the moment. And one of the reasons we've been campaigning as well for Lloyds and RBS to be back in the private sector is, funny enough, if you're state-owned, you definitely can't raise capital because yeah, when Mervyn asked the question to the Treasury representative of the Financial Policy Committee, will you put more equity capital into the banks, the answer came back as a straight no. Um, so uh, there's, there's a number of things that you know, the government and the Bank of England could do, um, and part of it's reversing current policy. Um, I do think that the, the role of challenger banks is very, very important. Uh, interestingly, we had a debate in here on privatizing the banks last night, and Lawrence Tomlinson, who's the entrepreneur in residence at... Um, uh, the BIS turned around and said, actually, my proposal is to break up uh, Lloyds and, and RBS into 10 smaller banks so that we have competition. And I made the point that there are lots of banks out there, uh, and in fact, you know, we, what we need is the new up and coming competitors like Shawbrook, um, like Hammers Bank, like you know, Santander to actually you know, uh, compete with the existing big guys. Um, but actually, and we were discussing this earlier, again, capital rules are a problem. You know, the smaller banks are discriminated against because they cannot use the internal ratings-based methodology for, for lowering the capital against, uh, against their loans. So again, there's more the regulator can do. Um, to pick up on the point about equity finance, absolutely, it's a massive hole in the UK. Uh, and one of the things I was saying to the minister last night, if you want to do one thing to improve SME finance, tidy up the equity side, you know, tidy up all your tax incentives, and I would say, yeah, we've got the Business Growth Fund, which I think is starting to do a decent job, but we need two, three, four, five Business Growth Funds so that just as a small company can go to different banks to try and get bank finance, they can go to different uh, equity providers to get their equity finance. Um, and then I think finally, and, and again, we're talking to the British Chambers of Commerce about this last night, it's about promoting the challenge of banks. It's about promoting the different types of finance as SMEs so that they don't just go to their banks, they go and tap into the other sources of finance as well. Thank you very much, James. Thank you much, everybody, for um, such interesting and thought-provoking speeches. And now we've got 30 minutes, hopefully, for a lively debate. If anybody here would like to start off by asking a question. Um, when you ask a question, could you um, please say who you are <coughs> and where you come from? Should we start? Okay. With the unmissable shirt in the second row. <laughs> well, that's all we can say about it. Howard Thompson, the Deputy Chair is of the Conservative Association in Spelthorne. Um, I'm the ex SAB Director. Uh, to what extent um, is reduction in expertise uh, by the people who uh, manage and run banks, particularly the, the big six, of course, uh, a, a big factor in this? Uh, when I was uh, running an SME in the uh, very early 90s, 1991, the biggest recession we experienced before the 2008, which I've still sold out. Uh, the second senior most uh, Barclays bank manager in my local branch, uh, the commercial manager who was, was even entitled, we were overcharged about 20,000 quid, when I, uh, and I, we sort of had a meeting, and it was established that he didn't understand the term compound interest. This is a banker, and you think, God, what, you know, what status is, is this it? And uh, I've been trying to raise about uh, 250,000 to build, but I do my own self-build, and all the banks I've so far contacted have uh, been, you know, Metro Bank is the only one that's actually a new entrant with apparent expertise in terms of going to the bank opening in Staines, that's actually interested in and has the expertise and sort of like reserve of knowledge and acquire that. To, to say, what is, to what extent, basically, is expertise an issue? Mm. Mm. 
wants to go first? Maybe he'll lend you some money. I'll go first. So expertise is not an issue for Shawbrook. In fact, it's fantastic uh, that the big banks have let so many people go because we've been able to, to pick up uh, fantastic, experienced people. So again, most of our underwriters have either got no hair or got grey hair, which, uh, <laughs> which helps. Uh, the second thing is that I've got 307 employees now. My biggest single category of employees are credit underwriters. That's the people who do the business. Uh, so the challenge, I guess, that the UK economy has is that these people leaving the big banks are coming to the smaller banks. And uh, they're doing that for two reasons. Partly because there's a push from the bigger banks, but there's a pull because people are just worn out with the bureaucracy, the challenges and everything else in the big banks and the breath of fresh air that they feel when they go to one of the smaller challenges makes makes a difference. They're lending again and that's what they want to do. They don't want to be in the department that's got to say no because there's a mandate from on high. I think Nora, do you want to? Well, I mean our experience is um, in the business plan and um, not understanding from a business perspective the potential of particularly new types of businesses yeah. and industries which which are you know now bearing fruit um, you know technology uh, has widened up a whole raft of new businesses coming on stream e-commerce um, run through digital platforms completely new way of doing business um, but unless um, you, you're talking to a relationship manager who understands the projections and the type of business that you're running, um, then that is part. That's where we've, we've you know, heard feedback from um, various individuals who are trying to raise capital that they've come up against a, a brick wall. Um, well, the, the, um, the big banks have actually been quite open in admitting they went, they've gone too far. Uh, not all of them, but feel, but they've gone too far in, into automating the process and the yeah. sort of computer says no. And uh, the relationship managers for businesses uh, in the branches basically being very, uh, yeah, having full heads of uh, uh, <laughs> non white hair. Um, and, uh, and they're actually going through, the, the, most of them are going through a process now of actually reversing that. So they might be trying to rehire some of your stuff. Uh, but uh, to, to get more experienced people out there, uh, training people up and so on, they do, they do admit that they've gone too fast. It's not, a, not an accusation of banks would deny most of them. Should we take another question? My name is Lise Woodock. I work for Oldmore, Challenge of Oak. And um, um, I've, I've just wondered what uh, the panel thought about um, having the equivalent of an Experian um, database. In, uh, for, it, we've got it for retail, for mortgages, for savings, and you can check at any given time you know, what your credit rating is. For an SME, if they get turned down by a traditional high street bank, um, it, would there be an appetite? I, I, is this a solution whereby they could turn to uh, the bank and say, well, actually, can I have my credit record? I've been with you for the last five years. Um, you've turned me down because you know, you're no longer in printing or whatever it is that they're putting out of. Uh, can, I take my, my, can I take my record um, and show another bank, i.e. someone like Oldmore or Shawbrook, that we're jolly good and we're, we're you know, we're we're a viable business and this is what we've done and we're actually at good risk. Do you, th do you think that's a, a, a good idea? Anthony for the bank? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we probably it's in my, uh, better idea about that. Um, I haven't heard that proposal before. I mean, it certainly you know, sounds like a good idea. I, you know, and it's just another, another thing. Well, right, no, it certainly sounds like a, a good idea. I, I would have thought, though, if there was demand for it. I mean, that sort of thing would only come about if the banks think there's a demand for it. I mean, the, uh, I think ex the, the credit rating agencies are obviously commercial entities, and they, they grew up because there was demand for uh, credit ratings for individuals. So if there is demand amongst the banks for that, the question in my mind is why... not rating agency, but just for no, them to be able to take their records and show another yeah. bank that they're no, good. No, no, it's an, okay. Yeah, interesting idea. We don't know that the PBA doesn't have a position on it. I haven't heard of it before, but um, certainly worth looking at. Yeah, I don't know what that is. I mean, it's one well, front line, operational front line. You know, I guess it sounds almost like a passport to say that, you know, that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm good for, for credit, it's just that my current bank doesn't, mm. doesn't it's not, I'm not part of their risk appetite anymore, mm -hmm. I guess. But I would probably disregard that anyway and still want to assess the business the way we do it just now, which is assess the individual, assess the business, and if it's asset backed, assess the asset. So even if that came, it would be part of the information pool, but it would not change my decision-making process within, within Shawbrook. So I don't think for me, 
in our business it would be it would uh, add, add value to the process. We'll stick to the way we do it just now. And I might just add on that. I mean, I think there is one one key flaw, which is Ian's kind of picked up on. Yeah, consumers are easier to, to measure because you know, you've got incomes, you've got assets, and yeah, for companies, yeah, often it's about the type of business you're in. You've got to make an assessment as, as a banker, like is that business sustainable? Uh, what's the track record like? You know, what's the cash flow like? You know, has it likely to grow? Where are the external threats? You can't do that on credit rating. Although I do think that you know, taking the point of um, what I said earlier in terms of anything that can be uh, done to increase transfer transfer transparency um, and inform and give back information, I think is to be welcomed. Although what you were saying earlier about the the business finance task force and the appeals. Um, a program is obviously another way that you can go back and have your application reassessed and then it may well be given but that is another way that it already exists and uh, to get more information fed back I don't know, I just, it came up as much. no well done <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got a question yeah. and then uh, I'm Neil Spurson from the West Midlands so I'd like to ask the panel but particularly Margot uh, from a political point of view uh, and the way the discussion's going about the two banks that we, the taxpayers, virtually own. Um, you know, it just seems a bit odd that um, owning them from the state's point of view, from the taxpayers' point of view, has restricted rather than enabled their role in this domain. And why politically didn't we take action to maybe break them up as was mooted at an earlier stage, uh, and we haven't done that. Now we're going to get them back into the private sector, but not very quickly. How do you see that uh, changing the situation? Well, I think that um, the decision to the, the priority for those two banks has been to repair their balance sheets and to get them off the sick list and back into business as banks. And that, I'm afraid, has mitigated against the lending um, uh, demand. Um, and I think that, that one of the reasons really that's prompted the government to decide to establish a business bank and to try to um, drive lending through these other schemes that we've discussed, um, which have been um, but partially successful, um, finance for lending, um, I heard one, one of the panelists mention that that's been more successful in driving mortgage lending than SME lending. The government has actually addressed that uh, back in May, I think, and I don't know whether it's had the desired effect yet, but they have recognised that it, 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 um, it requires more of an incentive for banks to operate that FRL on uh, SMEs rather than mortgages. So additional incentives have been put in place. but. Um, I, I don't think that the state owning the banks has been the answer because it's a vicious circle. You've got to uh, restore their health and have them back in operation as banks. And the, the, the means of achieving that, which has been the priority, has restricted their capacity to lend. Should we have let them go? <laughs> I know it's Should we have now. let them go in? Bus. Well, we couldn't have done that with the number of depositors who would have lost their deposits. I mean, essentially, you could argue that the government, you know, in theory, could have just provided the deposit protection. Um, that might have been cheaper. Uh, actually, I, I think Lehman's is a good example of what happens when you let a bank go bust. I mean, the pro problem is, for anyone that says, actually, just treat the banks like an normal organisation and let them go bust, um, they're just far too in interconnected. Um, for that to happen. Anyone who thought it was a good idea for RBS or Lloyds or his age boss to, to go bust, you know, d don't, don't know, you can't think of the counterfactual. I mean, the counterfactual would have been an utter disaster for the UK economy, trust me. Um, so the government had to intervene to do it to save the financial system. My point earlier is that um, you know, getting them back into the private sector will at least enable them to be able, potentially, if they need to, to, to raise capital. I mean, Barclays has gone and raised capital. Um, Lloyds and RBS haven't been able to. Uh, on your point about, you know, should we have uh, done good back, back, back earlier? Possibly. Um, yeah, if you wanted to, you should have done it back in 08, 09. I think for the coalition, when it came into power, it's like, you know, that one's too difficult to do with, with, with Parker. Um, I was kind of anti the, uh, what George Osborne did in the, in the summer, which was to go and look at good bank, bank, bank for RBS. Now, I think it's a bit too late. 
And I think you know you, you could still do it, but it's a relatively small part of RBS's <coughs> you now. And the big problem, going back to what I said earlier, is that you know, and, and if, when you talk to people at the Bank of England and in government behind the scenes, they will go, yeah, we kind of know that it's a problem that we've been trying to make these banks safer, um, and that's what's been restricting lending. But it doesn't actually stop them then going out and criticising the banks for doing it. And yeah, you know, if you inside the banks, again, one of the reasons why you've had the computer says no is that from a top-down level in the big banks, when you've been trying to meet these capital targets, you have to put it through a computer system because otherwise, you, know, you don't have the freedom that you've got, um, I'm afraid, you know, to, to basically go and lend that money because they've got a clean balance sheet. You've not got a clean balance sheet. You're capital constrained. To some extent, it has to go through a computer. And a lot of that's, that's been the problem um, of, of reorganizing and, and actually making these banks you know, fit to go back in the private sector. But it's one of the reasons why we've been arguing very strongly that get them back into the private sector sooner rather than later, and then they can start to act like commercial organizations again. Thank you very much. Any questions? Good evening. Here? I'm Rupert Hancock from the Top Nose Constituency, the Association okay. Chairman. Um, I'm here really because I'm trying to reactivate our business club that we have in our constituency. We have lots of small and medium-sized enterprises, we actually no big businesses. And from time to time I hear that they're having trouble getting finance. I thought I might come along here and get some ideas, maybe even a speaker to come and address some of them. But my question, getting to the point, uh, if I may ask uh, Margaret James, you must come across a lot of businessmen, and you've mentioned in your few words that you don't often hear that uh, they're looking for, for finance. So do you actually ask them, or do they volunteer the information that they're having trouble getting loans? Well, <clears throat> I don't ask them directly, but I do go around businesses, I visit at least two a month. I do have some come to my surgery, but generally I, mean, I make it a policy to visit at least two a month. And I do ask them what their issues are, and what their main challenges are, and I rely on them to, to answer that question, and not many of them um, actually raise the issue of uh, finance. That was a bit different two years ago. Um, but as I said earlier, um, it may just be my part of the world, and, and there's some trust, I think, between some of the local banks and um, my SMEs. Um, but, but more more than didn't told me that it was the banks that helped them through the recession. Uh, I can only report what I find, but that's, that's what I have found in my own constituency. I also think, as somebody said, it's very important if, you get, if your companies get turned down for finance, um, then they should appeal because I've seen uh, I've been involved in several times um, wh where they go to a regional level where they go to the uh, Barclays and Nat West in my area have regional SME divisions based in Birmingham and um, quite often when it gets escalated to that level um, then the, the loan and I quite appreciate loan finance is just part of the story but when it is loan finance is approved well that 40% figure was amazing yes I, I, I I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't surprised to hear that because yeah, I've seen it happen. Secret, it's published. I, I wasn't surprised to hear that sort of my personal experience of um, going with companies to uh, the regional um, SME lending experts within those two banks and the decision at the local level has been overturned. Thank you. Um, my name Anthony Renan. I just wanted to, yeah, the, the, um, we, do, we do actually do a survey, a quarterly survey of SMEs and their uh, sort of appetite for finance. And the, uh, uh, and it's done independently, we fund it. But the, and it shows that 76% of SMEs don't actually want any uh, finance. And uh, so and it, and it, there's often, a, uh, in discussions about SMEs, there's often a very sort of monolithic view of uh, all SMEs are exactly the same, they're not. I mean, uh, the, uh, a, a lot of SMEs are, the, the overwhelming majority of SMEs are actually not the gazelles that are sort of going for growth with great business <laughs> plans. They're actually lifestyle businesses where people are quite sort of happy and they don't want to take on debt and they just sort of, and that, that is the large majority of SMEs. Um, the, the other thing is that SMEs, and this was touched on earlier, but the, we publish the statistics, as well, monthly statistics for, for SME lending from banks and, and deposits. And the, the, the one, net lending has gone down, uh, the one really striking thing, though, if you look at the graphs, graphs is the amount of uh, the amount of the deposits of SMEs have gone up. And so historically, SMEs are net uh, uh, borrowers, or they borrow more money than they have in their savings accounts. 
that is not the case now. And their savings, are, they've now got a, a cash pile of about 120 billion pounds, which is extraordinary. You hear a lot written in the papers and so on about cash piles and the big companies, but actually the SMEs are in the same position. And we asked them why, one of the, one of the one of our questionnaires, why, why are they building up these uh, cash piles? It's gone up 6% in the last year. And uh, th the reason is lack of confidence about the future. I and mean, that they, uh, when you're worried, and the, the last survey, I think it was on three months ago, so it might have changed in the last few months with economic confidence returning. But the, uh, if companies are worried about the future, they do the same as individual people. They don't take on loans and they, uh, and they pay, and they uh, uh, start boosting their savings. And hopefully if confidence returns, they'll have a bigger appetite for, uh, for taking on loans. But it's still obviously an appetite. I mean, Ian's shown us, you know, there's a, Gaps <coughs> but even on, not. Yeah, even on the saving side, so again, this is another area where you know, a switch to the Challenger Bank makes sense. I offer 20 times more interest on business savings at Shawbrook than uh, the big high street banks offer to their, uh, their deposits. So my fastest area of business de of deposit growth is business deposits. So it was, you know, you know six, eight months ago, it was probably 5% on the deposit basis. Now it's now getting on for 15%. So again, that's, I think businesses are waking up to those cash piles. And the fact that they're earning nothing on it uh, at the big banks and therefore you know, shopping around makes sense. So may I ask a supplementary question of Ian? Um, do, you, do you have a regional bias or are you we, we, no, we, we, in the UK? So we, 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 are, we are basically uh, primarily online and internet uh, driven but most of our business comes through professional intermediaries on the high street. Uh, so all of our lending is spread broadly evenly across the UK. There is a degree of Southeast bias with our property portfolio, but apart from that, we're lending across the UK. We've got another question at the back. Yes, Theodore Agnew, I'm a trustee of Policy Exchange. My question is probably to James and Anthony primarily. James, I'm just wondering whether you're aiming at the right target of the Bank of England trying to persuade them <coughs> to reduce capital buffers when the banks have behaved disgracefully and they privatised their profits, and then when they went bust, all of us had to bail them out. So at least capital buffers, raising them, gives some small sliver of protection for us in the future. So wouldn't you be better to push to lower the regulatory hurdles for setting up new banks? Because Anthony says that he has 150 members, but he also admits that the vast majority don't lend to SMEs, and I suspect if he was going to be candid with us, there were probably less than 10, actually who are actively lending to SMEs in this country. And we need more shortages, I think. I mean, he mentioned Handel's Bank, and there's people like Ford and Co. And uh, if you can get a loan out of those guys on good terms, you're a very, very strong borrower. So I, I'd just be interested to hear your views. Um, uh, I mean, we, we, we've been doing both. I mean, you know, we pressured the Bank of England to you know, look at you know, making it easier for uh, uh, the small banks. We, we, were, dis we were discussing it uh, uh, to, tonight about different ways that that could be done. I and mean, one of the big problems the challenger banks have got is that they, they can't do this kind of internal rating-based assessment of capital, which the big banks can do, and it puts them at a competitive disadvantage. I mean, that has been taken on board to a certain extent. They've lowered the initial capital that um, some of the challenger banks have, have got to have. Um, on the bigger banks, um, yes, we needed to make them safer. The argument I've been trying to, to get out there is to say, you know, be careful of trying to do it too quickly because, you know, we can all, anyone can make a bank safe. We can, ins we can insist it has 20% tier one equity capital, you know, 40% total capital, and it'll be safe. It just won't lend anything. Um, and the, the problem with people who've said, let's look at alternative finance, challenger banks, and everything else is, it's great, we can grow it, and yeah, they've been growing their, their balance sheet, but in comparison to the big banks that are already there, yeah, it, it, it helps at the margin. If you constrain the lending ability of the big existing banks by forcing them to have these kind of high capital ratios, and all I've asked the Bank of England to do is to give the banks some flexibility around those capital ratios, um, you, know, you cannot grow credit in the economy. And you know, the line or the chart that I put in you know, our Bank of England document, our capital requirements document, was that chart of uh, you know, business lending growth. It's, it's been negative for the last four years. So it, it's, yeah. yes, we want to make the banks safer, but you don't have to do it all in one rush. And I would argue that right now, in terms of the quality of their loan books, because yeah, they divested themselves of some of the bad quality loans, you've got much safer banks, but already in terms of their balance sheets, and we're insist on much higher capital ratios. You don't have to get there in one go. And it's the Bank of England's desire to get there ahead of everybody else, which has really frustrated me. The, um, 
I'm not sure what the number of banks are lent to SMEs, but I'm sure it's more than, um, more than 10, I'm sure. We'll go back and count. And uh, the, uh, but you're right, the general principle, I mean, we, we support competition in banking. What, one important part of that is reducing barriers to entry and barriers to growth for uh, smaller banks, making sure there's a level playing field, because as was touched on earlier, actually in many ways, the, uh, the, the challenger banks face a, um, a sort of unlevel playing field compared to the other ones. And in fact, we've set up, at the BBA, we've set up a challenger bank panel to uh, address these issues of barriers to growth and entry. And, uh, Ian's actually one of the members of the Challenge Bank panel, making a very valuable contribution. Uh, and um, we, uh, but what, one, the, your, your second question about the uh, capital, I mean, the, the fundamental question is here, is how much risk do we want in our banking system? And the, the, the politicians keep asking me to, to keep saying the banks got to do more SME lending. The reason they don't is because SME lending is very high risk and they've got to de-risk their balance sheets. And uh, I find it ironic that on the one hand, they're saying the banks were far too risky before the crisis, and they blew up the whole you know, economy and financial system by taking up too much risk. Uh, and now they're being urged to take on more risk. And it was probably, we, we think, a sort of warm Friday afternoon sometime back around 2009 when banks were having exactly the right amount of risk. But uh, at the moment, people are thinking they're, they're, they're taking on the too much risk. But that, that's a... <clears throat> There's no perfect answer to that, but clearly there was too much too much risk before the crisis. There now seems to be uh, a lot of people urging banks to take on more risk. And the, 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 re the reason why uh, the FLS scheme hasn't really affected um, uh, uh, business lending is because it doesn't address the it doesn't touch on the issue of risk. What it does do is it reduces the cost of funding, so it makes loans cheaper, which is good for mortgages. Mortgages are basically incredibly low risk. Uh, they're, they're backed by a house. They're, they're the safest form of lending is prime mortgages. And uh, so it just makes them cheaper, which is fine and it's great for, you know, if you're a homeowner or a home buyer. Uh, because it doesn't reduce the risk of the business lending, it doesn't really, it, it isn't really targeted at that form of, uh, the, the way it's constructed doesn't, won't make, uh, increase the bank's appetite for business lending. If nobody else has a question, I think Rupert in front had a supplementary question. Well, I'd like to say that's probably the, the thing that the elephant that hasn't been mentioned is the, the too big to fail issue. That's what politicians are scared of. I mean, LBS is bigger than the British economy. It's the biggest bank in the world at one point. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, 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 it provides a whole new level of risk. The, 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 the most risk important country can't stand. You know, it's, it's, you know, you're leaving aside normal commercial issues. The most the most important thing to address in, in the wake of the crisis, the most important policy issue to address is obviously making sure that the crisis doesn't happen again. And that means making exactly. sure that uh, banks are safer uh, but also that uh, you address that too big to fail problem by making sure uh, that they have uh, that, that if they do get into trouble, that there are systems in place uh, to uh, to prop them back up without recourse to the taxpayer, uh, or to resolve them in a, in a way that doesn't damage the, the wider economy. And it would be, I mean, I answer the question earlier about why didn't we let RBS fail? But it would have been utterly catastrophic for the economy and the confidence and everything. It would have been catastrophic for the UK. And the government was simply faced, un under the regulation we had at the time, with either you let RBS fail or you prop it up with however many, however much, you know, billions of taxpayers' money, both of them extremely unattractive, but one was slightly less unattractive than the other. Whereas the, the whole, one of the big purposes about all the different legislation that's gone through and the Recovery and Resolution Directive, which is EU legislation, is to make sure there are proper powers and systems in place so you can intervene in failing banks without having to uh, go to the taxpayer for a handout. And that's the most important thing that we need to sort out. And we are, we are getting there. Most of the bits are in place now. Uh, can, I, can I just pick up on that? I mean, look, too big to fail is, is an issue. And, and the whole of what the regulators are trying to deal with now is getting us to the point where these banks, not so much they're too big to fail, but you can actually, even though they're such a big size, there's a, there's a way to wind them down, there's a way to actually deal with, with, with the issue. Um, but, you know, do you want to get to the point where the banks are too big to fail and the economy is cratered because they can't lend in the meantime? You know, the, the, it's a balance. This is what, what I've been arguing about. We know we're going in the right direction. Um, and if you look at some of the documents we've, we've written, we, we actually looked at you know, how RBS has delevered its balance sheet, what Lloyds has done. They all got, they've got much better liquidity positions, much more capital. Um, they've got rid of so many of the bad assets. The chances of RBS or Lloyds failing tomorrow are way, way less than they were in 2008. And the regulators did an appalling job then, you know, both Mervyn King and the FSA for not actually looking at RBS, Navy and AMRO and going, what the hell are you doing? Um, you know, I worked in the city at that point in time. Every bank analyst could tell you that Avian Amro was the worst bank in Europe. 
um, and actually the RBA shouldn't be touching it with a barter pole. So what were the regulators doing? What you've got now is regulators going in the opposite direction, and again, we were talking about this this afternoon, is that any regulator does not ever want to put his name to something which says, oh, I encourage a bank to take a risk, and, and it failed. Even if it's a small bank, even if it's something that is small enough to fail, they don't want to do it. So the regulators are erring on the side of caution. What I've been trying to argue, and it goes back to what we were discussing earlier, is you know, it's fine for regulators to do that, but there is a cost to that. We have to recognise that cost. That's the argument I've been trying to get out there. You know, the banks are safer. You know, if you allowed RBS or Lloyds or HSBC or Barclays a <laughs> bit more slack on their ability to lend, uh, are, you, are you running a risk that actually they fail? No, you're not. So it's a, it's a it's about getting the balance right. Thank you. Thank you. Howard, my question. Uh, yes, uh, I agree with absolutely everything that James says about um, you know trying to get ahead of the curve in terms of uh, capital ratio requirements. Uh, the oddity that uh, uh, it seemed to me fairly recently, I mean the reason the capital ratio requirements are important <coughs> is because the percept you know all other things being equal. The perception of bankers is that improved leverage, i.e. reduced capital ratios, improves their profitability. Now I read a report somewhere, really just recently, about the banks up in uh, Sweden, or the Nordic countries, where they had a mega crash in, in uh, the banking situation in Sweden about 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, and this report was saying that their capital ratio requirements are like double, that we are challenging our banks to get to uh, today, the Basel three. And yet their profitability is a lot better than you know banks have been historically achieving in the UK. So you know I that really blew my mind. So perhaps that's something that the panel could comment on. Uh, well, I'll start. I mean, the, the, the don't forget the Scandinavian crisis was a, a bit like many other banking crises. We were about SME lending, but actually they were all property related, and you had a property boom and property bust in, in Scandinavia. Right. Um, but they had the massive advantage of they rebuilt their banks when the rest of the world was actually growing oh, yeah, really no, yeah, quite yeah, nicely. Yeah. Um, we, we're trying to rebuild our banks at a time where the entire world is growing slowly. Um, and therein lies the difference. At the end of the day, you can get to a position where you, know, you get better capitalized banks and they can still be profitable. You don't have to you know, kill off profitability. You, know, you, know, you can be a, a, a profitable bank and a well capitalized bank if you're run <coughs> properly. By the way, uh, it may mean you have to charge more for your loans. You know, just to give you a, a rough number, if you have 5% uh, tier one capital and it costs you 10%, mm -hmm. that's a 50 bit. So you've got 10% and it's 10% because you're 100 bits. So you know, there is a cost to raising your capital ratios, and it basically means your your is more expensive. Doesn't mean you can't get a return on capital. Yeah. Okay. I'll just reinforce what's just been said. You know, at the end of last year, when we published our accounts, we had a core tier one capital ratio of 17%, which made sure we were one of the best capitalized banks <laughs> in the UK. But obviously, I wasn't. I wasn't leveraging that to the optimal degree. It's, it's a lower number now. But again, we view our capital position as a pretty important dimension for a new start bank when people are considering depositing with us, for example. So uh, the capital angle is important, and uh, you shouldn't lose sight of that. Yeah, well, the report didn't, uh, did, didn't con consider any of those con con consequences to the clients of these banks. It was reporting profitably to the bank. And it was, uh, so, yes. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the main problem to the banks in terms of capital is not, uh, as um, uh, James is saying, it's not necessarily the, the level they get to. It's the, it's the, the timing issue and the speed at which you do it. Yeah, so absolutely. The, yeah, yeah. yeah, so I mean, the, yeah. the fact that um, raising capital levels while we're in recession is, is uh, pro cyclical, as absolutely. it were. I mean, it reinforces the uh, uh, economic downside. It would have been ideal with the benefit of hindsight to have done that in the boom years. <laughs> yes. uh, but, you know, we, didn't know, we didn't know that was happening. But the other one is just the speed of requiring banks to do it. And this absolutely. is what causes yeah. them a yeah. problem where you have to suddenly increase the amounts of capital. Well, I thought we had slowed up. Uh, in, in terms of our requirements of Basel III. In fact, I thought the Basel uh, organisation had decreed or publicised their interest in slowing things up. Uh, so when I went back to the banks this year to publish, to try and finance myself, Bill, I had hoped that things would be better than they were uh, a year ago. Uh, as it turns out, no. I, I, the response I got in terms of financing what I wanted to do in, in self-building was no better than it was a year ago, and that, which is, is highly frustrating. Right. Yeah, well, well, of course, we have gold-plated Basel III by forcing yes. its introduction here earlier than anywhere else, so that's yeah. probably what 
that did for you, discovered your plans. But I just wanted to point out that not all challenger banks are new banks. Um, Handels Banken is a Swedish bank, is oh, at yes, least 150 years old and has a very solid capital base. Yeah. So they're not all new. Yes, I've yes, got that. They, they, you might consider approaching them. Yeah. As Mer Mervyn King <laughs> yeah. really annoy you. <laughs> Mervyn King famously did a letter to a small business who wrote to me, wrote back saying, Go to Handels Banken. <laughs> <laughs> It was the first company listed on the Swedish Stock Exchange. That's how old it is. Um, any other questions, or shall we, shall we end it here? I would interject on a positive note that today the new RBS chief executive started, Ross McEwen, and he one said of board members. one of the board members, and he said in a short speech to staff that one of his main aims was to increase lending. So hopefully, that is the sign of positive net lending figures to come. Thank you very much for coming. It's been a very interesting discussion.